this is Ruchi. I am here to present on my topic today and I've chosen a psychology of use. It's a rather large topic and as I was studying uh, the topic for the presentation, I just realized just how much, how vast it is and what all it comprises of and I'm excited to share with you today. So uh, psychology of use uh, you know, talks about how the choices that we make and how they determine our personality and our lifestyle. It's not what we have, but what we do with what we have. Uh, you know, that is what determines our style of life. And uh, we will also see, as I will talk, that how everything that we do is towards the goal of superiority. It's that movement uh, from the minus to the plus. Uh, as we talked about recently, and Dr. Lee also uh, brought that up. So going back into the topic, I'm going to start with what Adler stresses. And he stressed that it's not what one has inherited that's important, but what one does with his inheritance. Mozak has also noted that life does to some extent provide limits to what one can do. But within those limits, the opinion one has of one's situation and the use one makes of it can be rather startling. The individual psychologist, as they work with their clients, uh, they must observe how a particular individual relates himself to the outside world. Uh, and when we talk about outside world, we mean uh, you know the person's body, his uh, mind functions, his bodily functions, and uh, it can be assumed that an individual relates himself to the outside world in a predetermined manner. Um, however, he relates himself always according to his own interpretations of himself and of his present problems. He, his limits are not only the common human limits, but also the limits he has set for himself. So uh, psychology of use uh, has uh, a big component uh, one of the big components is the cognitive process uh, and then we'll talk about you know the character traits um, as well so as far as the cognitive process goes uh, Adler has made a distinction between common sense and private sense which he also calls as uh, private logic common sense is that which is shared with others it's the ability of speaking the common or the same language and uh, the same perceptions that we share with others uh, one of the basic ingredients of common sense is that we all agree upon it. And, um, you know, while we all agree upon it, it can still be a fictional thing. It's like, you know, uh, a paper bill, a dollar bill, a currency bill. It's, it's really paper. But as a society, we have uh, together come to agree that that paper has value. And that's why we're using that as a mode of, you know, as a currency for commerce. Private logic, on the other hand, it comprises of immediate goals, um, hidden goals and lifestyle goals. Lifestyle goals are fictional goals and they're generally unconscious and not clearly understood by individuals. Immediate goals are short term and more easily attainable. These two are not clearly understood. The hidden reason is the explanation we give ourselves for what we are doing and why. Cognitive process such as intelligence are greatly influenced by a person's private logic. For instance, if something does not suit a person's private logic or the use of his or her intelligence, then the person may choose to basically, uh, you know, fail in school, for example, um, and, you know, just happily exclaim that, you know, I failed because this was my first time making a decision for myself without having my parents involvement or my before without my parents telling me what to do so um, that's one example of uh, private logic and then um, outside of this uh, cognitive process uh, consists of you know our perceptions our learning style our memory so perceptions are uh, you know so unique to each individual everyone uh, no no two people would perceive something the same there'll be variation in how uh, one sees things and uh, you know they're based on you know just just one's knowledge one's culture one's um, you know way of looking at things um, some perceived notions so uh, 
perceptions are not strictly identical to reality. Thus, what a person perceives and how he does so constitutes his particular uniqueness. It is more than a physical process. It is a psychological function and from the way in which a man perceives, one can draw profound conclusions regarding his inner self. Then, uh, talking about learning, Adler was emphasized really on learning and uh, training. And outside of learning and training, he also um, had a focus on an individual's interest uh, and his creative style of learning, which he thought were crucial factors in the whole learning process. And uh, the observations of adolescents and children and even adults who for some reason are particularly given to imitation show that no one imitates anything which does not suit him in some way. Educational influences are likely to be accepted only when they seem to hold a promise of success for the individual style of life. The individual sees all his problems for the, from the perceptions that is his own creation. By observing children, we can often see them training for an occupation in adult life. When we see a child build bridges and large buildings and just problem solving, uh, we see like a budding engineer. When we see a child who wishes to be a teacher, we see that child bringing other children together and just kind of, you know, playing school. So uh, these are just some kind of, you know, examples of how observing children, um, we can often see the training uh, that they are actually doing uh, while playing. Um, memory is another part of a cognitive uh, process. And Adler noted that what we remember is greatly influenced by where we are going, like the future determines our past. We... Um, Remember those events whose recollection is important for a specific psychic tendency. If I want to move towards someone, I will remember pleasant things about that person. However, as soon as I want to move away or against that person, I will remember negative things. Not only does a person remember what suits his or her purpose, but forgets what does not suit his or her purpose. Memory, like many other tendencies, is greatly influenced and used according to the goals we set for ourselves. Memory is not a gathering place of impressions or sensations. Memory, like perception, has the function of fitting impressions to the style of life and using them accordingly. Anything that is not palatable to the style of life is rejected or forgotten. People who are forgetful uh, do not like to rebel openly, but who through forgetfulness betray a certain lack of interest in their task. Now moving forward, we'll talk about character traits and how they influence the way we behave and the way we create or curate our lifestyle. Character traits convey to us an understanding of an individual's attitude towards environment, his fellow beings and the community at large and also his problems, life problems. All character traits reveal the degree of social interest. They run along the line that leads to the goal of superiority. The way we express ourselves, our bodily postures, our attitudes to indicate the manner in which uh, we approach our goals, uh, our body language, the way we shake hands, whether we are, you know, just go-getters and in the center when there's a large gathering or a meeting happening or we are standing in a corner in a distance, uh, they all reveal more directly the individual attitudes that we have and they speak more than the conversations that we have about um, our attitudes towards life. The way we sleep, people, the doctors have observed patients sleeping in the hospitals and the postures that they sleep in, whether they're sleeping straight or they're sleeping curled up and how they determine a person's, uh, you know, complexes or uh, you know just strengths our organ dialect or inferiority uh, two individuals with the same impairment may not be equally disabled uh, the stances that they take towards the situation can be crucial determinants in what their attitude is towards life so I remember 
when Carrie and I did our presentation um, two weeks ago, we talked about this example where there was this a pair of siblings. One was uh, perfectly normal, and then there was another girl who was uh, who had a leg impairment, I believe, and how she was just able to follow her sibling. Um, and just kind of be independent and she had the support from her mother who did not see uh, her younger daughter's impairment as a negative she actually just let her be and she just let her be independent and i remember sharing during that time i don't know if it was me or carrie but we shared it together that uh, <clears throat> that young girl was able to dress herself uh, because she had the support and the encouragement uh, last week when some of our other peers were presenting they shared their own uh, examples and stories of how support system and encouragement around them uh, help them uh, you know come up and come over their own complexes uh, so that's what this talks about it depending on uh, our our support system and our network how two individuals with the same kind of complexes and inferiorities can uh, take them very differently there's also a uh, organ dialect it is uh, you know a defiance or a refusal for normal function due to jealousy uh, or pain for example you know a toddler just starting to uh, wet their pants uh, when a newborn uh, comes in the family because you know uh, they they show jealousy because they're not able to get as much time from their parents as before especially if it is you know the first child and the second child come so that is like an organ dialogue dialect to a certain degree every emotion finds some bodily expression the individual will show his emotion in some visible form perhaps in his posture and attitude and the emotions and the physical expressions tell us how the mind is acting and reacting in a situation which it interprets as favorable or unfavorable whenever there is tension there is action in the central nervous system with every emotion, the whole body is in tension. And Dr. Lee talks about it uh, really well and uh, uses a different term for it, the somatic psychology, and just kind of, you know, listening to your feelings in your body and just feeling in your heart. Uh, this reminded me of that. Um, and then each individual's body speaks in a language of its own. When one man is in a situation in which he is afraid, he trembles. The hair of another will stand on end. A third will have palpitation of the heart. So it is always necessary to look for those reciprocal actions of the mind on the body and the body on the mind, for both uh, of them are parts of the whole with which we are concerned. Uh, our emotions uh, are also used uh, to uh, move towards our goals that we establish for ourselves. Some emotions move us towards others and others move us away. Adlerians tend to view emotions as motivators of behavior. Emotions are like the gasoline we use to power us for our goals. Um, they are psychological movement forms, limited in time. They appear always where they serve the purpose corresponding to the life method or the guiding line of the individual. Their purpose is to bring about a change in a situation in favor of the individual. If someone is angry, it generally serves the purpose of motivating one to change something. Um, when we see that someone is really able to empathize in a situation, we see that there is social interest. Sympathy is the purest form of social interest. And Adler has uh, believed that for healthy emotional process uh, to develop, uh, we need a strong social interest and lastly I want to talk about uh, you know how we think about a man and women or left and right and you know light and heavy these opposites as contradictions uh, but from the scientific point of view these are not contradictions but varieties uh, and in some way like good and bad normal and abnormal are not contradictions but varieties and um, so from here i'm getting to the point like you know if any theory talks about sleeping and waking as contradictory or dreams and our thoughts during the day as contradictions uh, then that theory is not scientific because uh, while we are sleeping our perceptions are not absent they may be diminished 
our contact with reality is lessened. If we are disturbed with problems, our sleep is also disturbed. The fact that during sleep we can make adjustments that prevent us from falling down of bed shows that we are connected to the reality um, even at that time. Uh, there have been discoveries by uh, Lynchburg and Freud which suggest that dreams always contain signs of vital problems which the dreamer does not recognize in his waking life. If during the day we are occupied in striving for superiority, then the same must be true for night. The dreams must be a product of the style of life. Then we are also talking about um, how we remember certain things and we forget others. Um, Everyone remembers certain important things and indeed what is fixed in memory is always important. Both conscious and unconscious uh, remembrances are equally important for the style of life. Many times it is difficult to find out the unconscious um, uh, remembrances. Um, while it is important to find them both, the individual understands neither of them. It is for the outsider to interpret and understand both of them. Similarly, we talk about truth and imagination, you know, we're doing our early recollections and this all is just kind of, you know, really uh, opening that up for me. Um, sometimes you're able to think about an early recollection that we remember and we consider that our truth. And sometimes we don't remember and we feel like that is something that was told to us by our parents. It doesn't matter whether something is truth or something was uh, you know told to us what matters and what's important is what we remember because that really tells us about our personality that tells us about where our interest lies and then um, what is conscious and what is unconscious uh, we um, know that more we know more as human beings than we understand and um, we don't know about what our goals are, but we still pursue them. Uh, we understand nothing about our style of life, yet we are continuously and continually bound to it. It is a general human phenomena to lay aside thoughts that stand in our way and take up those that advance our position. All individuals consider for the most part only those things which are useful for their view and attitude. This all comprises of psychology of use, you know, how we perceive things, how we put what we have to use, no matter what we've inherited uh, or what is given to us or what is surround, what we are surrounded by is what determines our lifestyle. So that was my presentation. I look forward to engaging with all of you uh, through discussion. Thank you so much for your time. Bye. And I hope you're well. I miss you all. Bye.